Okay, so let's get started with this. Um, you can titrate anything. You can titrate an acid and a base, but an acid-base titration is the same as doing a titration just to find out how much stuff is inside your beaker. So when you, uh, yesterday I did the demo for you, you're using sort of the same sem setup as we did yesterday with the buffers. So you always need to kind of envision this picture in your mind. You have something in your beaker, say, floating around with an unknown amount. We don't know how much is in here. It could be an acid, it could be a base, and then you use your burette and you dropwise add in a known amount of substance. And so if you know how much you've added in and you know what the molarity is and you know what the volume is that you add in, you can figure out how many moles you ended up putting into this solution. Your moles will equal your moles when the reaction's over. So if I have A, I have five moles of A, and I put in five moles of B, all of A goes away and becomes something else. So that's sort of the idea of any titration, whether or not it's an acid base. So we're going to do a little bit of vocab so that you understand it, and then we're just going to dive right in and solve the uh, acid base problems. So it says a strong acid of known concentration is added to a base mixed with indicator, or a strong base of known concentration is added to an acid mixed with an indicator. So it could be vice versa. Either one of these could be in there. Acid being titrated with base or the other way. So we will call this substance going in here the titrant. That's always uh, a word that they'll use. So instead of saying it's titrated with, it might say it's the titrant. That's what's going in there. And then this is our solution or our unknown amount. They might just say the solution in the beaker. There's no specific. Sometimes they use the word analyte. I don't know that they really use that, though, in AP Chem, but they might. The analyte is what you're analyzing. Um, and the titrant goes in there and reacts with your solution. You put an indicator in here, which we'll get to at the end of this lecture set, but the indicator you already know changes color to let you know that your reaction is complete, right? So we can choose indicators based on the pH ranges that we're looking at, and we'll do that again near the end. But just recognize that the color change is going to be different from when the reaction ends. So I say the reaction ends, but my indicator doesn't necessarily tell me the reaction's ended until the pH slightly changes. So take, for example, the one that we did yesterday. Our pH um, indicator was like right around 7, essentially. So when it got over 7 into the basic range, it changed blue, right? So when my reaction ended, it didn't change blue until I added just too many moles of sodium hydroxide because then it went into the pH range over 7. Are you all following that? So my indicator didn't actually change color until the pH started to rise dramatically. So you can think about that, that the pH stays sort of in this zone for a little while, and then as soon as there's too much excess of whatever the titrant is, the pH drops or increases dramatically. So these two different words, the end point and the equivalence point, are different. And I do give you these on your test. I want to make sure that you understand the difference between them. Sometimes the AP exam does the same thing. The end point is when your, your um, indicator changes color. So if your indicator says, hey, now the reaction's over, it almost means your reaction was over like a little, little bit ago, but now I'm just going to let you know by changing the color. And we don't really care that it's off slightly because it would be only a very, very small difference. The equivalence point is something we can't see. It's when your moles of acid are directly equal to your moles of base. But the indicator doesn't show us this. We can't see this. It's not visual. So that's why we're going to use... Uh, the indicator specifically to show us that point. Right. So the equivalence point is what we're always calculating. We'll calculate equivalence points, but we won't be able to see that until the end point is reached, which is when the indicator changes the color. And I, again, I'll go over that in more detail. I have some graphs to show you. Um, so that's what that slide says. So there's three types of acid and base titrations that we're going to do. They're on this sheet. So this sheet says strong acid with strong base. This is type 1. On the back of it is a weak acid being titrated with a strong base, but you could have the opposite. You could have a weak base being titrated with strong acid. 
I just didn't make this in three pages. It's essentially you handle the problem the same way, except like just like we did with KAs and KBs, you just reverse it. So if you're writing an acid reaction, then if it's a base, you write a base reaction. And instead of using KA, you would use KB. So when we do this tomorrow, we're just going to kind of change everything if it switches it to a base. But here are your three types of reactions. And you should know this from when we did reaction writing. If it's a strong acid, I write H+. Plus. If it's a strong base, I write OH-, minus, and it completely makes H2O. If it's a weak acid, what do I write? The whole thing. HA plus a strong base, I write OH-, minus, and this is going to make H2O plus A-. Minus. And then if I have a weak base, I'm going to write, and I usually kind of put like a BOH, plus H2, I'm sorry, plus H plus is going to make H2O uh, plus B plus. I mean, there's different ways to represent a base, but we'll do it like that. But we know that our weak bases can be like an ammonia compound or whatever it is. It's just making water and then the conjugate acid of your base. So today we're only going to work on strong acids and strong bases, and then we'll get to those two tomorrow. So you know that I think most important would be to write your reactions before you start. So we're going to solve this one problem, and then we're going to be done. So I'm not going to flip through the slides. I'm going to do it all over here on the board. So you flip through your slides and follow along and write down what you think is necessary. Um, so I'm going to leave this picture up to kind of draw what's going on in this one, and then I'll solve over here. So it says we have 3.0 times 10 milliliters of 0.5 molar hydrochloric acid was titrated with 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide. Before you start, you should ask yourself, what's in the beaker and what's in the burette? So what's in the burette? The NaOH, right? So I have sodium hydroxide here with a known amount. It told me that it was 0.5 molar. Uh, I'll write all my sick fix out. So this is 0 0.50 molar of sodium hydroxide, and that's moles over liters. Then it says that I have in here hydrochloric acid, right? And this is, what is it telling me by saying 3.0 times 10 milliliters? Exactly 30. Remember, right, these volumes are going to be so important. Even in my burette, yesterday I was kind of showing to you the markings on it can read to a tenth of a milliliter. So we really can get accurate volume measurements when we use the burette. And likewise, we would want to know the exact volume of whatever's in this solution, because then we'll be able to calculate moles of this. So this saying 3.0 times 10 is different, because if I wrote 30, that means I can't really read the ones position based on sig figs, right? But if I write 3.0 times 10 technically to the first, that means I can read the ones position. It just happens to be that the meniscus for 30 falls right there on 30. Make sense? All right, so there's 30 milliliters of that in here, um, and this is 0.5 molar also. So find the initial pH of the HCl solution. Is there anything in there at this point? No. Literally, you've taken a 0.5 molar hydrochloric acid solution, and there's 30 milliliters of it, and it completely dissociates HCl into H plus plus Cl minus, right? And if this is 0 0.50 molar in 30 milliliters, then this is 0 0.50 molar in 30 milliliters. So you find pH from of a strong acid directly from the negative log of the H plus. Look what I wrote here. It says at first sight, I'm sorry, not at first sight, before any titrant. That means before anything's added in, it says the reaction is the acid goes into water and dissociates. So take pH, or if this is a strong base, take pOH directly from the H plus or OH concentration because of 100% dissociation. So pH equals negative log of H plus, but if this were a base, we would do pOH equals negative log of OH minus. So I'm going to plug this in directly. pH equals negative log, and this is a 0 0.50, and since there's two... Uh, Sig figs, my answer should have what? Two decimals. Two decimals. So negative log of 0 0.50 is going to be a pH of 0 
And that should make sense because it's a strong acid, so we have a really low pH. Part B, find the pH after 15 milliliters of sodium hydroxide were added. So at this point, we've added in a certain volume. And lots of questions will ask you a variety of things. Like it will ask you, what is the volume of sodium hydroxide that could be added until it reaches its equivalence point? Its equivalence point is when the moles of this are equal to the moles of that, right? We could find the volume. This is literally the same question as what was just on your quiz today. Is finding the, the number of milliliters when the solution buffers out. So basically the same thing is true. If something's buffering out, it means the moles of this are equal to the moles of this. At some point, they equal each other, right? So for us, since we're just learning this, I'm telling you that this is not at the equivalence point yet. We're before it. So this is the at first sight spot. So look at that, at first sight. So at first sight, it says subtract out moles reacted in a one-to-one -one ratio to find leftover moles of solution in the beaker, divide, the total vol divide it by the total volume in the beaker to find the new concentration, and then again, you find it directly from the H+. In other words, at this point, now you've started adding it in, our reaction is H plus plus OH minus gives water, isn't it? And neither of these are weak, so we're just going to be reacting them and make an ice chart, and whichever one's left over is how you find a pH, right? There is no weak acid, weak base dissociation, so pH is found directly from the amount that's left over. So how many moles of H plus do I have in here? Original moles of H plus. Thank you. It gave you your molarity and it gave you your volume. So 0 0.50 molar is to x moles over point, what's this, 30 milliliters, so 0 0.030 liters. So you have 0 0.015 moles of H plus floating inside your beaker. How many moles of OH minus now are we going to have? So we have our original number of uh, the molarity of NaOH is 0 0.05 molar OH minus, and it says that we put in 15 milliliters. So how many moles of OH just went in? 0 0.0075 moles of this. This isn't a one-to-one -one ratio, right? So they're reacting. This is limiting, so all of the moles of this go away, and we subtract out the moles of this, and there's zero moles, and we don't care about water, so we just squiggle that out because that's not part of this. And so I end up with 0 0.0075 moles of H plus left over. Agreed? All right, we can't take H plus concentration from moles. We have to divide this by the total volume. So what is your total volume now? 45 milliliters, so 0 0.045 liters. So this volume came from, I guess I'll have to write it over here, our 30 milliliters in the beaker plus the 15 milliliters from the burette. And I add it up and I get 45 milliliters total now is in the beaker. So this is that volume that goes there and this gives me my new H plus concentration in the beaker. And I need the new H plus concentration because that's going to change my pH. Can you see it? It says 30 milliliters in the beaker plus 15 milliliters in the burette. So for part B now, I'm going to solve for the pH. And the pH is going to be equal to the negative log of this concentration. So 0 0.0075 divided by 0 0.045. So 0.17 for sig figs, and then I'll take the negative log of that, and the pH will be equal to 0.77. Make sense? All right, it do, goes up a little bit, uh, but not very far off of our original 0 0.30. Are we okay with that? All right, so now we're going to go to 30 milliliters of sodium hydroxide for letter C. So I'm just going to erase B. We're just going to do it again. Realize that I could ask you to add any volume and you just keep making ice charts. So at any point, 
at first sight could mean any volume. I could put 12 milliliters, I could put 17 milliliters, 23 milliliters, and just ask you to keep calculating the pH, and the pH will continually be calculated based on this ice chart. So right now we're just going to change this amount here, and we're going to find the new pH of our solution. So our original number of moles is 0 0.015 for H+, because that's, again, from this original amount told to me. And now it's telling me that I put in 30 milliliters. So if I put in 30 milliliters, that's times 0 0.030 liters. Again, now I have exactly 0 0.015 moles of OH-. minus. So this is called what? The equivalence point. The equivalence point. So our equivalence point means we have the exact same number of moles of H plus and OH minus. If we were thinking of this in terms of a buffer, we would say this is the buffering capacity, right? Because this is the maximum number of moles that your buffer could accept. This is not a buffer. Why is this not a buffer? Because there's only an acid in here. And you don't have a weak acid, right? A buffer has to have two components in it to be able to accept any disturbance that gets added in. This is just a titration. So all of this goes away, all of this goes away, this is zero, this is zero. So all I have floating in my beaker is water. Water has its own auto-ionization, right? That goes to these two things, which we've said from lecture one, the concentration of both of these at 25 degrees C is 1 times 10 to the negative 7th, which means that the pH of this is 7. So at the equivalence point for any strong acid or strong base, read it on the chart, is always equal to 7 because water is being made. And the pH of water at 25 degrees C, pure water, is 7. So we're going to say the pH is 7 at the equivalence point. Always for a strong acid, strong base system. Following? Okay, so then there's part D. The pH now after 45 milliliters have been added. So I'm going to erase this ice chart. And my pH. And I'm going to recalculate based on sodium hydroxide being 0 0.045. So fill in your ice chart. So we had 0 0.015 moles of this. We put in 0 0.022, probably 0 0.023, I guess, moles of this. Uh, 0 0.015 minus point, I'm sorry, other way around. Your limiting reactant at this point is this, so you're going to subtract out 0 0.015 and subtract out 0 0.015. So there's none of the H plus left over, and now we have a surplus of hydroxide with 0 0.008. So this is the number of moles of OH floating in the beaker. Can I find pH from OH concentration? You can find pOH, right? So now I'm going to find pOH by dividing my total number of moles of OH by my new volume, which in this case now is going to be 75 milliliters, right? Because I added 45 milliliters from the burette, and there's 30 milliliters already in the beaker, so my new concentration has to include the 75 milliliters that are in there. So the concentration of OH in this beaker is 0 0.11, maybe even 0 0.1, but we'll use a few more sig figs just for fun. And then we'll say pOH is equal to the negative log of 0 0.011 molar. And then we subtract that from 14. So my pH is equal to 13.0. Uh, I suppose if I'm going to have more sig figs here, I should add them in. 13.04. I probably should have gotten rid of the sig fig here. It should have only had one sig fig. So that would be 0.1, and then my pH would have been 13.00. So it follows exactly this. It says too much now. So after I've passed the equivalence point, I've added too much of one of them. The substance that I added too much of in this case is too much hydroxide. So it says subtract out moles reacted and find pH from the leftover moles of titrant in the beaker. 
Find new concentration by dividing leftover moles by total volume and find pH from the excess H plus or OH minus in the beaker. Either use pH equals negative log H plus or pOH equals negative log of OH and then 14 minus it. I mean, it's verbatim, this problem, right? Just tells you how to solve it. So all of your practice problems, you're going to either use this side or this side. And the way that you'll know is you'll look at the substances and you'll say, this is a strong acid and this other piece is a strong base. If it's not a strong acid or a strong base that you're starting with, then you're going to use the other side because it'll be a weak acid or a weak base. Okay? All right, so now we're going to discuss what the titration curve looks like. I know that we've never even discussed that you could graph this data, but you can. And when you graph it, a titration curve always looks the same. And the curve itself gives you really important information. So the first thing that we'll recognize is that you have your volume of your titrant being added on the x-axis, okay? I want to write that down because it doesn't say it. So the volume of the titrant, whatever is going in, uh, is going to be on the x-axis. And then on the y would be your pH change as it's increasing because we're adding sodium hydroxide. So lots of questions. They love to ask multiple choice questions for these. What is in your beaker? What is the analyte? An analyte is what's inside the beaker, the solution. Sort of think of it like this way. The analyte is what's being analyzed. I'm trying to figure out what's, how many moles of the analyte there are. All right, so what is inside your beaker, an acid or a base? An acid, right? But you know that because I already told you you're adding a base. But what if this isn't here? How do you know that you're starting with an acid? Because the initial pH is low. Common sense, but these are multiple choice questions and you guys sometimes sit there so stressed out, you're like, I have no idea. Just look at where you start. If the pH is really low, then it's going to be a strong acid. Like really low means like somewhere in the one range, right? What if it starts here? Then what is it? A weak acid. And if it starts here, a weak base and here a strong base. Okay, we'll look at base curves in a little while. So our initial pH for a strong acid is close to 1. And so we already saw when we just practiced that question just now that we did a base being reacted with an acid, right? But we saw the pH was originally like 13 point something and then it gradually started to go to like 12 point something and then all of a sudden when we passed it, the pH dropped to like 1. That's what happens when you do a titration. It kind of holds itself at the pH that it should be until you've just gotten to your equivalence point. The second you run out of moles of acid and moles of base and you switch to the base, because that's what we're adding, the pH immediately goes up. Can you even see the volume change there? Like within a milliliter, the pH jumps from down here at a 1 all the way up here to like a 14. Okay? And look at the small little region that that's in. So when we say it's a when we're calculating these numbers, we may be off slightly because of this little range that we're going to see. And recognize, again, that we're doing this with an endpoint indicator. So our endpoint won't change color until we've gotten up to the basic range, when really here is the exact equivalence point. You can tell from a graph where the equivalence point is because it's exactly halfway between these two top and bottom of your curve. So you can mark it back. We know, though, that with a strong acid and a strong base, that the pH should be 7. And it is. But if the curve is a weak acid with a strong base, the whole curve will shift. All you do is find the halfway point and plot it back to the pH, and you'll know where the pH is at the equivalence point. Everybody got that? So your midway point on the graph is your equivalence point. Midway is your equivalence point. So what it's showing you in this slide, it says the change in pH is less than 1.5 over the region, where most of the base required to reach the equivalence point is added. The change in pH is very large in the vicinity of the equivalence point, and we already discussed that. Okay. This is just taking the problem that we did this morning and asking you a different set of questions for it. You should still be able to answer it because it's still the same idea. So draw yourself a picture before you start, if you feel necessary. I like to. It says 
31.25 mils of an acid was titrated with. So I have in here my H plus 31.25 mils and it's 0 0.250 molar and it's being titrated with something, some unknown concentration of sodium hydroxide. We don't know what it is. This is a really great way to figure out an unknown. So you can analytically calculate based on your experiment. So it says the end point was reached when 32.75 milliliters of OH entered. What does the end point mean? It means that moles of acid are equal to moles of base visually. Even though we might be a little off, we're still going to say that's the same thing, right? It's still the same thing as the equivalence point in a sense. So the end point was reached when we added that amount of that. Find the concentration of the titrant. So now I can find this. Molarity is going to be equal to x moles over 0 0.03275 liters. We're looking for this, right? So what piece do we need? Moles of? We need moles of base, right, that are going to go in when we reach the end point, which is like the equivalence point. So moles of base will have to be equal to what at equivalence? Moles of acid. Of acid. That's what end point and equivalence point mean. Moles of H plus are equal to the moles of the OH minus. We don't know this, but we know this because we know it's in our beaker, don't we? So to find the moles of HCl initially there, you're just going to do a molarity calculation. So you take 0 0.250 molar is equal to x over 0 0.03125, and you solve for moles. So you get 7.81 times 10 to the negative third moles of H plus that are originally in my beaker, which means that that's going to be exactly equal to the moles of OH minus in the beaker once it's been added in. So now I'm going to take this number of moles and add it into this equation and just simply solve. So you just divide and then the new concentration here, once I add that in, is 0.238 molar NaOH. Any questions? Yeah. Yep. Good. I think, right, drawing the picture makes sense. Writing out the equations makes sense because you'll know what pieces you're missing. When you sit there and you just struggle and you don't write anything down, of course the answer is not just going to come to you. Write down information that you know. Write down, well, what is concentration? It's molarity equals moles over liters. And then maybe you'd find your answer. All right. The titrant from the previous example was used, so let's just write down that information so we don't forget. That's 0.238 molar NaOH. That's what we're using to titrate 28.65 milliliters of an HBr solution. The endpoint was reached after we delivered 38, 34.85 mils of titrant. Find the concentration of the original solution in the beaker. So look, my beaker changed, but really it's still a strong acid, so I'm going to just leave H plus, right? And then in here, um, I'm looking for the concentration of HBr that's originally in there. And it says that what's floating in here is 28.65 milliliters of this solution. So this time, it says that we're going to deliver 34.85 milliliters of my OH inside there. And But we're trying to find the concentration of this. Concentration molarity equals moles over liters. We have liters, don't we? It was right there. This is of your H+. plus. So if I have that, can I find moles? Because it gave me the end point again. So if I know my end point, that means the moles of base will be equal to the moles of the acid. So here's my volume, and here was my concentration. So we can calculate that right here by figuring out 
0.238 molar is equal to x moles over 0 0.03485 liters. So that will tell us how many moles of sodium hydroxide are delivered. So we're going to deliver 8.29 times 10 to the negative third moles of OH minus. That's what's going to go into my beaker. Which means that that must have been exactly equal to the H plus moles, which is 8.29 times 10 to the negative third moles of H plus. Are you following this? Moles of acid equal moles of base. Yes? How did you get the liters for... Um... It told me the end point. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. It told me the end point was reached. That means after you deliver 34.85 milliliters in here, the color changed. So the end point means moles of acid equal moles of base. So we calculated that from there. So now the concentration of this is going to be these moles over my original volume that was floating in the beaker. Notice that we don't add volumes here. I want to know what the original concentration was, not what the new concentration is. The original concentration comes from this. So you just divide and you get point. 289 molar H plus was floating originally in the beaker. That's not the current concentration because you did add 34.85 milliliters. I just want to know what's the initial concentration based on the moles that were titrated divided by the original volume. That's going to be tricky for you to remember when to use total and when to use original. But it'll say in the original solution, so you know, use original volume. All right, now we're going to switch. So flip your sheet over that I gave you. And we're going to start using weak acid, strong base. Your, what is in your burette will always be the strong. What is inside the beaker could be the weak or the strong. But just make sure you note for yourself that your burette always holds the strong. So your beaker could be the thing that is going to be the weak acid or the weak base. All right, before we even do this problem, let's just look at what happens when you titrate a weak acid with a strong base. Okay? A weak acid is HA and a strong base is OH minus. One way arrow, this is going to make A minus plus H2O. Do we all agree? In the last example, when we did our titrations with a strong acid, strong base, this is strong with strong. It's just H plus plus OH minus gives me water, right? But when you have a weak and a strong, you're going to end up with a conjugate, either a conjugate acid or a conjugate base on that side. So when I go to solve this problem, and I'm going to find my pHs, so we just did that with strong and strong in the beginning of class, we found all our pHs. It was either pH was directly from the negative log of H plus, or pOH was directly from the negative log of OH minus, right? Well, now when you find your pHs, guess what? These moles react with these moles and make these moles. So you will have A minus and HA floating in your beaker, and that is called a buffer, right? Any time that you have both pieces floating in your beaker simultaneously, it is a buffer, and then we treat this like a buffer problem, which is why I'm stressing so much to you that if you didn't understand your buffers, you can't do titrations now. So I sent you home with extra practice problems for the buffers to make sure that you really get that. And if you don't, then you need to see me for extra help. So on the sheet that I gave you, it walks you through each step, but it specifically says that it's for a weak acid titrated with a strong base. If I switch this to a strong acid, this, this sheet, Nelson, we're on. If I switch this to a strong acid, being the titrant, and then I'm titrating a weak base, you're going to have to flip all these reactions. And it says that down there, titrations for weak base with strong acid, and then it shows you before titrant is added and it gives you the reaction, and then I'm suggesting that you write out all of those reactions after that. We'll do that later today. 
So we're going to get through probably like one of these problems. Um, and then we'll try some practice from your worksheet. All right. Uh, so this is potassium phthalate. They use, I think that's what this is. Yeah. Uh, they use this one very, very commonly as a way to what's called standardize a solution. All right, so standardization means that you have a concentration of a base that's going to go in your burette, okay? So I go in the back and I pull a 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide burette uh, solution to pour into my burette. But I'm trusting that the manufacturer made that correctly. I'm also trusting that my colleagues didn't accidentally dilute it when they were using it or did something to it. And that kind of stuff happens all the time. So you have to check the concentration of what you're about to use. It's called standardizing it. So you standardize your standard because we're going to use that to be our titrant. And if I don't know the exact concentration of what's in the burette, I can't do this correctly. So you're going to standardize it to make sure the concentration is what it is. You do that with sodium phthalate. And there's other reasons for it, but it's really like a very stable compound and doesn't pick up any water, which is an issue if you're weighing something and it's hydroscopic. It could pick up water and then it, the weight is incorrect, which means the moles are incorrect. Okay. So we're going to use this and it says it was dissolved in water. So this is what's floating in there is my um, HCAH4O4 minus, right? Because the potassium is just going to dissociate. And then it was used to standardize the sodium hydroxide. So that means that the NaOH is in my beaker. I mean my burette, sorry, in the burette. It says the endpoint was reached after 42.55 milliliters of this titrant sodium hydroxide were added. Find the concentration of sodium hydroxide. Same thing as before, except in the last example, I had already in there a solution. This time I'm putting in grams. So if the end point is reached, what does that mean? Moles of acid equals moles of base. See, this is what's going in there. This is the reaction that they're giving you. So this reacts with this. It turns into this and then this. That's what they're basically showing you. Um, right. I'm going to pause that for a second. We're going to solve for our moles of the sodium phthal I'm sorry, potassium phthalate that's in there. So you take your 3.145 grams of it and you do molar mass to find moles. The moles of this are equal to the moles of this at your end point. Agreed? So this mass is 204.22 is equal to 1 mole. So we get 1.540 times 10 to the negative 2 moles of our potassium phthalate. So it says that this is the end point when these moles are equal to the moles of OH. So to find the concentration of the titrant itself, sodium hydroxide, it's the same number of moles, right? Because at the end point, they are equal. They are equal. So I take those moles and I divide them by the volume that was added to reach the equivalence point in liters. And I get a concentration of 0.3619 molar NaOH. And I hope you recognize I'm just going back and forth between NaOH and OH because they are in a one-to-one -one mole ratio. If they weren't, that would be a problem. I'd have to do stoichiometry to solve for that. Okay, so now we're going to look at the actual titration of a strong ass, uh, weak acid with a strong base. So it says the titrant from the previous example, I'm just going to drop, jot that down, that was the 0 0.3619, is that what it says? That's what we're using. Was used to titrate in our beaker, we have acetic acid. We know that is weak, right? So now we have to recognize we're doing a weak acid with a strong base titration. We put in 25.65 milliliters of this. 
And then the end point was reached when we have this volume. So right away, so I'm finding the concentration of the O8, the acetic acid initially. I can just go ahead and use my moles of my titrant, and again, that's equal to the moles of the acid, and then divide by what volume? The original, because we're trying to find the original concentration. So let's do that. Moles of sodium hydroxide delivered is the concentration. Molarity equals moles over liters. So you know that I like to do it the other way. I don't like the dimensional analysis way. Is equal to x moles over... 0 0.02840 liters. All right, so that gives us these moles of OH, which then in turn are going to be equal to the moles of acetic acid. At this point, it doesn't matter if it's a weak acid or a weak base, you still, at the end point, have your moles equal to each other. And then you take those moles and you divide it by your original volume, not your total your original volume that was in there to find the original concentration of acetic acid, which is 0 0.4008. So now we're going to look at taking a weak acid and titrating it with a strong base, and we're going to do all the parts. So it says we have, again, 30 mils exactly of this weak acid titrated with a strong base. So first question, let's just go through them all. Determine the volume of 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide that must be delivered to reach the half equivalence point. This is something totally new. It's, I hate it. It's sort of ridiculous, except that it gives you really good information. I don't like to use the word half equivalence point. But uh, what is half equivalence point? At the equivalence point. So you have to find the equivalence point first and then divide by two. All right, the reason why we like to find the half equivalence point is because then that will give us the pKa. And then if you get your pKa, you can find your Ka for your acid, which means that you don't have to go look at a book, or if you have some unknown acid, you can figure out the Ka value of it based on a titration, which is really uh, helpful and good information. So part B says the pH at the half equivalence point is measured to be 4.74 find the pKa, and then identify the main species that are present in the solution being titrated at the half equivalence point. Oh, I don't know that we'll have time to get through all of this. Um, we'll, we'll solve this tomorrow. We're going to take a break, and we're going to start your practice problems tonight for your titrations of your strong acids and strong bases, okay? And then we'll pick this up tomorrow. Okay, so we are going to now move on to weak acids or weak bases with a titrant being added. The titrant always has to be a strong, though. So just keep that in mind. So what's in your beaker, your analyte, could be strong or weak, but then the burette will always be the strong piece. So uh, this question is just to kind of show you something, not necessarily that you're going to have to do these calculations. We'll move on to harder calculations. But uh, we sort of read this yesterday, and then I wasn't interested in moving on. So uh, we'll finish it today. So a 30 mil sample of this, which is weak, we just know it's weak because it's not a strong, right? It's titrated with sodium hydroxide, uh, sodium hydroxide. Determine the volume of sodium hydroxide that must be reached to be delivered to reach the half equivalence. All right, so you're going to find how much volume is needed to reach the equivalence point, and then you're going to divide that by two, right? We already recognize that. Then we're going to calculate the pH at the half equivalence point. I'm going to show you that, and then that's going to be sort of like a a known piece of information that you will always use. It's just going to kind of show you how to figure that out, but then you'll, kind of like the pH is always 7 at, at equivalence for a strong acid, strong base, you'll recognize a constant inf piece of information for this. And then we'll just evaluate that. So first part for letter A, find the half equivalence. So we're going to find first uh, the moles of the weak acid that are initially in the beaker like we did yesterday. So go ahead and do that. So we just use molarity. And then we calculate the molarity. 0 0.50 molar is equal to X moles over a 0 0.030 liter solution. You get 0 0.015 moles of your weak acid. So then the volume of the base that has to be added is molarity equals moles over liters. We've done this probably like 10 times yesterday and it was all on your homework. So you have to add 0 0.015 liters, and this is for your equivalence point. 
So if we're looking for our half equivalents, what are we going to do? You're going to divide by 2. So I think that's what it said. Uh, de determine to reach the half equivalence point. So this just jumped to B. Sorry. Um, this is actually not finished. And then it ran over to the next question. Determine the volume that must be delivered to reach the half equivalence. So we're going to take this volume and divide it by 2. I don't know why the slide just stopped. It didn't put that piece of information in there. So this is the volume. Ah, I see what it is. They divided the moles by half. You could do it either way. So they took 0 0.015 moles, divided that by half, and put that as the moles here. <laughs> Got it. I didn't see that that was happening. So I think just because the way that I would have done this initially is I would have taken the 0 0.015 moles uh, for my weak acid, and I would have calculated my equivalence point and then divided that by 2. Um, so if you do it that way, um, you'll still get the same answer. So this would have been 0 0.030 liters if you did your 0 0.50 molar is equal to these moles, 0 0.015 over x, you would get 30 liters, I'm sorry, 30 milliliters, and then you would just divide that by 2 to give you the 15 milliliters. Yes? Where did they get the 0.50 moles on the bottom? That's because they don't, I do molarity like moles over liters. They use molarity as moles over liters as a conversion factor. They always do that in this slide set, okay? So, Grace, you probably did it like this. 0.5 is equal to moles over x, and then we solved for x, which is fine. So half equivalence just means we go halfway. You could do half of your moles, or you could do half of your volume. All right, so now we're going to look at part B, which is find the pH. I'm sorry, the pH at the half equivalence point is measured to be 4.74. Find the pKa. All right, so at the half equivalence point, if we evaluate what's in our beaker... We had, floating in there originally, the weak acid. And then we titrated it with a strong base. So I'm going to write out the reaction for you so that you can see what's happening. When you have a weak acid with a strong base, you essentially have HC2H3O2, right? Weak acids, we don't, we keep them together when we write the reaction. I write it with OH minus. And now, this is a one-way arrow, and what do I make? You all know this because you all did really well on that reaction quiz, right? What do you make? Acetate. Acetate and water, right? So this is partly why I focus so much on those reaction writings, so that you know how to do this all the time. All right, so at the half equivalence point, I didn't, we could calculate the moles. What were the moles from the last one? 0 0.015, right? So if this was 0 0.015, and I use half the number of moles here. This is 0 0.0075, right? Yeah. Okay, so halfway, if I'm ice charting this, I'm just showing you half of this goes away, half of this goes away, and this was not there initially. Unlike our buffer questions that it was in the beaker initially, this time it wasn't there initially, was it? So now I add my 0 0.0075 here. So at this point, I end up with 0 0.0075 of this, none of the base, and I have 0 0.0075 of this. What is this? That is conjugate base. This is weak acid. Whenever I have a weak acid or a weak base with its conjugate, that is called a buffer. So you make a buffer whenever you are titrating a weak acid or a weak base with a strong. And you'll recognize that if you write out the reaction, right? So you just made a buffer in here because now you have both parts. You have a little bit of acid and you have a little bit of base. And so, therefore, the concentration of these two, or the moles of each of them, are equal, right? If we plug them into the henderson hasselbach if this is equal to this, then what is this number? One, what is the log of one? Zero. So then the pH is equal to the pKa at the half equivalence point for a weak acid or base titration system. Got it? Not true for a strong strong. 
It's only for a week with a strong. So this becomes a constant that you have to just sort of memorize. So the pH is equal to the pKa at half equivalence. They love to ask this question on the AP exam in like a random format. And this is only for weak, strong titrations. So we're going to keep that in mind as we solve all of our problems with the weaks and the strongs. So pH is equal to the pKa at the half equivalence point. Always true for a weak, strong system. Even if it's a weak base with a strong acid being titrated in. The last part says identify the main species that are present in the solution that should say being titrated at the half equivalence point. So let's evaluate, right? So by the way, this is sodium hydroxide going in, right? We can't forget about that piece. So do we have any base at half equivalence? No. We have this. We have this in exactly the equal amounts. And then what else do you have floating around? And you have sodium. Uh, so this H3O plus thing, I kind of have a question mark in my notes about this because it's, I think it's sort of odd that they would throw that in there. Um, I think they're just trying to say that this is an acid system, so therefore there is an acid dissociation to this. Um, but I don't, I don't really agree with that one too much as being one of the predominant um, ions floating around. So I would have just listed those first three. Okay. So this is what a titration curve looks like for a weak acid with a strong base. How do I know first that this is a weak acid? Starts around four, right? I know that this is telling you it, but you will get graphs where you have to predict what it is. So we know that it's around a 4, so that would be a low pH, not a 1, so it's a weak acid. Um, and then our equivalence point is the halfway point as you go up that. So what was the pH at the equivalence point? No. About 9, right? Because you look up, this dot will not be drawn for you on an exam, right? So this is going to be there. You draw your dot and you go over. You're going to do this lab. You're going to do a titration curve. You're going to measure the pHs. You're going to do all of that. And you're going to plot a graph. And you're going to answer all the questions based off of your own data. So you actually draw this, or Excel will. And then you'll find out your pH at the equivalence point was 9, which should make sense to you because you're titrating with a strong base. So it's going to pull that pH up. Um, the initial pH is. Okay, so that all makes sense. And then the halfway equivalence point is equal to your pKa. So this is really useful because we say, right, I always give you the Ka value, but you can obtain a Ka value from doing a titration because once you find the pKa, you can find the Ka, right? Uh, it says the change in pH is less than 1.5 in this region where most of the base required to reach the equivalence point is added and then the change is very large. This region right here is our buffer region because I just drew for you out the reaction, right? Until you reach your equivalence point, you have a weak acid reacting with a base forming the conjugate base, right? You have weak acid in your beaker and it's being used up. The OH minus is reacting with the weak acid, taking the H off. Let's just write it again. HC2, H3O2 plus OH minus gives me my conjugate base. So as this is being added, it's taking this H off and making conjugate base. So until all of this is used up, you have a buffer. So everybody make sense of that? Until it's all used up, you have a buffer. So this is our buffer region, which means you need to use Henderson-Hasselbach. Okay. This curve is just a lot of like a lot of ups and downs and ups and downs, but it's for a polyprotic acid. What does polyprotic mean? Poly meaning many, protic protons. So this is for an acid that has more than one H. So for example, this acid has 
one, two titration curves with it. Do you see that? So this must mean that it's a H2A acid. If it were H3A, not that it would go up past 14, but you would see another one of these with another midway point, which would be an H3A acid. Like phosphoric acid should have three titration curves, essentially, because it can lose its 1H, then its next, then its next. So for this one, let's just evaluate what they're trying to show me. Initially, I have all of the acid as H2A besides whatever weak dissociation you have with it. So then it's being titrated. It's 50% H2A and 50% HA minus, just like this was going to its conjugate. The conjugate of H2A is HA minus. So I begin to titrate. Once I get here, all of the OH has ripped off one of the H's, and now I've made primar pri primarily HA minus. And then I begin to titrate that. At this point, half equivalence, I have half HA and half A minus, right? And then at the equivalence point, it's completely A minus, sorry, A minus two. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then you have two equivalent point pHs. So this one's roughly around six point something. And then this one's roughly around 12. And then you can calculate your pKa values based on the half equivalence point. Lots of information on that graph. Any questions? Okay. So now we're going to look at how an acid base indicator works and how to choose the correct indicator. And then we're essentially done, but yet we've like barely solved any titration questions. So that's why I want to focus a lot of our time tomorrow on practicing them. And I'm going to give you a handful of AP questions to try, just so you can see the variety of ways that they'll ask it for you. All right, so an indicator actually is uh, going to be titrated itself. So we titrate what's in the beaker, but you're actually titrating your indicator as well, because you're trying to make the indicator go from its own acidic state to its own basic state, or vice versa. So that's why we only add like two to three drops, because adding a large volume of an indicator would mean that your titration amounts are going to be off. Like your moles of base, say, going in your acid beaker, are going to titrate what's in the beaker, but they're also titrating those drops that you're adding. So if you add way too much, now your values are going to be all off. So you only add about two to three drops. So H-I-N, okay, this uh, is going to show up, I think, on one of the lab questions that we do, so just make sure you refer back to this. What it's saying is I-N means the indicator, okay, and it's the acid form of your indicator. So all indicators are either in the acid form or the base form that you're going to be putting them in. So if you put them in base, they're going to probably pull off that H+. plus. So this is the acid form of the indicator. This is the base form of the indicator. This is going to be one color. This is going to be the other color. For phenothaline... What is it for this? When it's in the acidic form, phenothaline was the one that I've done with you a million times now with the, well, maybe once, but with your valentines that you made? It was clear, right? Because then you sprayed Windex, which is basic on it, and then the base color turned pink. Get it? So that's what it means by the acid base part. So it says it's highly acidic solutions shift the equilibrium left. So if I put my indicator into an acid beaker, it means that it's going to shift this because of Le Chatelier's principle. An acid would be floating around. This would be the common ion, and it would shift it even further to the left. Okay? And it says H plus from acid in solution being titrated causes that shift. If you put your indicator, like if I put phenothaline into a basic solution, the solution is going to be pink right away. That's because it's going to shift that equilibrium it's going to remove, right, if you put it in a base, it removes this because it reacts with the indicator itself. And what does it do according to Le Chatelier's? Shift right, right? Let me just write this for you because some of you are not remembering. If I put this in a base, so I dump this whole thing in with an OH minus, so it, the beaker is the base, this reacts with this to make water. That means that the concentration of this goes down and the reaction shifts right to compensate, so you end up with IN minus floating around. Remember that? So it depends on whatever the beaker is that you have it in. It's either going to be in the acidic form or it's going to be in the basic form, depending on what the beaker itself is holding. All right, that's just to tell you what color it should be. 
That's the only thing that this slide is really explaining, how you can figure out what color your solution is going to end up being. So this is how it works. In a titration, there is a large shift in pH as the equivalence point is passed. We know that from those curves you see. I'm just going to quickly go back to show you a curve. Uh, let's just look at this one. You literally are adding less than like a milliliter, and your pH is going to go from 5 to 14. So if your indicator is like, oh, I'm going to change color between 6 and 7.2, it doesn't really matter if it's going to start changing anywhere in that region as long as it's within this region here, right? You're going to see the change in color because the amount of drops that you're going to add are within a milliliter. You're not going to be far off because that pH change is going to happen so rapidly. So that's what this slide is saying. There is a large shift in pH as the equivalence point is passed. So we're just going to go quickly increase on that graph. This large shift in pH causes the indicator's equilibrium to shift and its color change. Just like we talked about with equilibrium, your OH is in there, now it's pulling it to the right, or if H plus is in there, it's drawing it to the left. <coughs> the color starts to change when this is equal to this. So sort of like when this is equal to this, at the halfway equivalence point, the same thing happens for the indicator. So it's going to say, hey, I have about equal amounts here, so I'm going to start shifting to the other color. The color change experienced by different indicators occurs over different pH ranges. You must select an indicator that changes color at a pH that is close as possible to the pH at the equivalence point, right? Because we don't want to miss it. What if I go back to this graph and I chose an indicator that shifts between uh, 3 and 4? Right? If I chose an indicator that shifts between 3 and 4, it's going to change color before I'm at my equivalence point. That's not going to help me. I want it to change color in this region, and I might be like a drop off, but it'll be changing color in this region. So if I were going to choose an indicator, I would want the pH of the indicator to change at roughly 9. That's what I'm going to be looking for. Oops. Uh, so that blue part down here, you must select an indicator that changes color at a pH that is close as possible to the pH at the equivalence point. That's what you need to look at. So this is just showing you sort of that these indicators act as buffers. So if, you, if you're halfway, they change color when their concentrations of their acid and their conjugate are equal, then it's like a weak acid with a conjugate, right? This is not a strong acid because it's not a strong acid. It's not one of our big six. So if you plot, make it look like a Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, it's going to change color when these two are equal. Again, log of 1 is 0, so the pH would be equal to the pKa. So you're going to get the pKa values of indicators or the Ka value of an indicator and then you find the pKa, and then the pKa should be equal to the pH that you're looking for when they're going to change their colors. So this is key. Choose the indicator that has a pKa equal to the pH at the equivalence point. Because we want them to have the same pH, but you'll just use a pKa value. You've got to memorize that. So the pKa of the indicator should be equal to the pH at the equivalence point. So for example, for a strong acid, strong base, what should be the pKa value? 7, because we know that the equivalence point is 7 for a strong, strong. What if it's a weak acid with a strong base? Where should the, P, the equivalence point be if you're titrating a weak acid with a strong base? Whip. Somewhere above 7 for sure, right? Like 8 to 10, I would say. There's, we don't really know because we don't know what we're doing. It with. I just want to make sure you didn't say 7, right? It's going to be above that, so our pKa should be in that range also. And then if I had a weak base being titrated with a strong acid, where should it be? In like the 4-ish, maybe 5-ish, 6-ish range. Not 4. The pH, well, it's going to like halfway. 4 would be a weak acid, all weak acid, right? So... Somewhere like below 7, maybe like a 5, 6 range is where that equivalence point is going to end up. So here are the pKa values of some common, um, some common indicators. And then you're just going to choose based on the equivalence point that you know it might be. So variety of them. 
uh, make sense to you. Like for a strong acid, strong base, we would never choose methyl orange, right? We would choose bromthymol blue. We could choose phenothaline. I mean, it's going to shift for sure because the pH for a strong acid, strong base is going to go all the way up to 14. So you, you can choose others, um, but here are a variety of them. Okay, so which indicator would you use when titrating HCl with NaOH? We just said bromthymol blue, right? So it's going to be yellow up until 7 and then change to blue once it turns 7. Which indicator would you use when titrating this acid with sodium hydroxide? Equivalence point occurs around 9.1. So look back at the list. Phenothaline. It's clear. Before that, turns pink. After that. Okay, since it's not on these slides and it's really important, I want you to sketch on that last page that you have a graph of what a weak base being titrated with a strong acid will look like. Weak base with a strong acid. Okay, so you should label your axes before you start and then recognize if it's a weak base in your beaker, right? We have something floating around here. Say it's NH3 and I'm titrating it with H plus HCl. Okay, so where should I start? Around this region here, okay? And then I know that my equivalence point should be where? somewhere around like a 5-6 range. So it's really helpful for you just to put a few little dots rather than just go for it. So I know that it's going to gradually go down. Maybe around here would be my equivalence point. I'm just going to jot that. And then where will the pH end up? When I've had too much H+. Plus. Near 1 because there's no more of the weak base in there. It's just going to be excess acid. So I'm going to put it like this. So notice that it's sort of like a straight line going down, okay? But I like to draw mine kind of like the, the straight line, the equivalence point here first, not all the way up to that line, maybe like a quarter of the way down. And this is slightly on an angle like this. And then this kind of drops gradually down there. So maybe you have to erase. It is never a straight line like this, right? That's not what it should look like. So you're going to draw sort of like a, an angle going down, and then it kind of angles out and then stays flat down there, okay? Now, if they gave you the volumes, you would put your little dots where the volume should be and then draw it. But if you just went for this, you might end up having some really odd-looking graphs. So I like to plot my points before I start to sort of tell myself where we are. All right, so... We're done with acids and bases, but you probably have no idea how to answer any of the questions. So I'm going to give you the rest of this block to work on questions with me. You're going to go through them um, each with me. And then tomorrow I will give you practice multiple, uh, not multiple choice, practice AP questions specifically. OK. Let me pause this. Okay, so number 10 from your homework set reads, a 28 mil sample of this is titrated with that. Uh, so right away recognize it's what with what? A weak with a strong. So weak acid with a strong, and I would like to write it in my beaker. So I'm going to put in OH minus going in, and then I have sodium, uh, what is that? We call that... Um, guess like a hydrogen sulfate sort of like a hydrogen carbonate sometimes you call it bisulfate um, but that's what it is okay just want to point out that HSO4 is what this really is that can behave both as an acid or a base right so in our case it's behaving as an acid so you're gonna end up ripping off that H plus and it's weak right 
So it says part A, what volume of sodium hydroxide must be added in order to reach the equivalence point? Okay, so to find the equivalence point, it's always moles of acid equals moles of base. So go ahead and solve for that. You already know how to do that part. Okay, so you should have gotten 56 milliliters based on calculating moles of acid, and then that equals your moles of your base, and then just doing a molarity calculation. The next question says, what volume of the base must be, order, must be added in order to reach the half equivalence point? So literally take 56 and divide it by 2. Pretty simple. So next question, that was 28 milliliters. Next question says, the pH was measured to be 1.96 halfway to the equivalence point. What is the pKa value for HSO4 minus? Justify your answer using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Right, so you already are going to memorize this, that the pH is equal to the pKa at the half equivalence point, right? So if it tells you the pH is 1.96, then what is the pKa? 1.96, but justify that. So justification is recognizing that this occurs. So you end up with this and this in equal amounts. At half equivalence, they are equal, right? So if I justify this using the Henderson-Hasselbalch, I'm going to take the Henderson-Hasselbalch and I'm going to write out my ratios or the whole equation, which tells me that the pH is 1.96 is equal to the pKa plus the log. And look, what are you writing your reaction from? Like, where is your Henderson-Hasselbalch coming from? Because remember I always said, like, write it from the reaction of the acid or the base that you, in the buffer that you started with. This isn't a buffer to start with. So you're going to write it from the reaction that you're looking at right now. And look, you know to use the acid version because it is a pKa value. I'm just going to point this out. I said before that this is an acid or a base, right? What if I chose to titrate this with H+. Plus? Then what would this expression be? PKB. PKB, do you get that? Now that's tricky because this could be an acid or a base, but I want you to recognize that your Henderson-Hasselbalch and your KB values and your KA values come from the reaction that you are writing them for. So if this is going to be treated as a base, then I'm going to write PKB. If it's being treated as an acid, I'm going to write PKA. So this is the PKA plus the log of, and now I'm going to put my product, SO4 minus 2, over my reactants, HSO4 minus, and if these are equal, then their ratio is 1. And the log of 1 equals 0, so then pH equals the pKa at half equivalence. So that's what they're asking you to do, is to solve and show and justify your answer. They may ask you to do that on the AP exam. I definitely have seen these half equivalence point things. They definitely like to ask you that question. Uh, if they ask you to justify it, then just explain that the ratio is 1. Um, next one, identify the species that have the highest concentrations in the solution at half equivalence. There it is. What is it? HSO4 minus, SO4 minus 2, and the, the spectator ion going in, Na+. Any questions with this one? So for number 11, A and B, you can do that yourself, right? We could pull that data pretty easily. And then it says the data from this titration was used to plot this curve below. Use the titration curve to estimate the pKa value for the following reaction. Justify your answer using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So it's giving you the actual reaction. It's, um, yeah, this is actually, the reaction that it's giving you is not accurate. Can you see what's wrong with that? They're showing you a reaction that is an acid going to a base, but they're telling you that you're titrating a base with an acid. So this is why that curve looks that way. I don't know why they're giving you this, but they are. All right, so let's look at this from, oh, I see why they're doing it. Okay, why, it's exactly what I just said before. They're showing you a reaction for a pKa, aren't they? They're showing you an acid reaction for a Ka. But you're going to be calculating what? A 
PKB, you're going to be looking at a base for yours. All right, so go ahead and take a look at this, and then I'll pull up the answer or show you the answer. Okay, what did you estimate your PKA value to be? Nine-ish? Okay, so what did you do? Yeah, I guess I overthink these things because to me, this bothers me that this is the reaction that they're writing for this because this is not true, this is true. Okay, so this goes to NH4 plus, uh, I should put my water in here, and then this is OH minus. So for me, I would probably have looked at this as a PKP value to start with, plus the log, and then I would have done the half equivalence point, which would have been one. So the pH that we're calculating at the half equivalence, if this is equivalence here, I mark that this was about 95. Is that how you did it? Maybe. So 47.5 is probably somewhere here. And so at the half equivalence point, my pH was about 9. So that means that your pKa would be 9. However, this is a base reaction that really bothers me. So what would I have done? I would have subtracted the 14 minus 9, and I would have said that's 5 is equal to the pKb at the half equivalence point. And then I would have done a pKa plus a pKb equals 14. And then I would have found my pKa that way. I guess my point to you guys is I want you to recognize that this is a base reaction. It's not an acid reaction. However, I can mirror image this, and now it turns into the reaction of NH4 plus turning into NH3. Do you see that? Because it's the reverse of it. You could start with this. It would just sort of be flipped. But you wouldn't start in a pH region of 1. It's just the reverse. I don't like the idea of asking you guys to calculate a pKa from this. I like the idea of asking you to calculate a pKb to start and then finding the pKa, right? Which is just the same thing. Just recognize a pKb value comes from a pOH. Got it? Mm -hmm. Why did you say we're going to get the pKa from the half reaction? Or the a half, half equivalence, because that's the truth no matter what. Oh, okay, so we're not getting it from like the end or result of the you always can take your P, your pKa is always equal to the pH at the half equivalence point. Your pKb is also equal to the pOH at the half equivalence point. Maybe that's something to really drive home, is that the pOH is equal to the pKb at half equivalence, and that would be for a base reaction. So this would be for a weak base, and then this would be true for a weak acid. Right? Do you all see what I'm pointing out to you? That's how I would have approached this problem. And then my part D would have asked you to find the pKa, just because that logically makes more sense for this titration. So then the next part says, which of the following indicators should be used to signal the endpoint of this titration? So it's giving you them. Let's look at the titration again. We want our indicators pKa value to be the same or as close as possible to the pH at the equivalence point. So I look at my titration curve. And then here again is my equivalence point, and so I can kind of jot that over there to be the pH. So look at your pKa values. What should we choose? <laughs> Methyl red. <laughs> so uh, everybody get that? You just look, it's around 4 to 5-ish, and then methyl red pKa values are around 4 to 5. Okay? And again, you could have found your pKb value of these, but why it's not really necessary to go all the way backwards. It just makes sense to me. Uh, identifies the species that have the highest concentrations of the solution at the half equivalence point, NH3, NH4+, and Na+. We all agree? And then the next one um, would be at the highest concentration at the equivalence point. So you have no more of NH3 and you have no more of NH4 plus floating around. I'm sorry, you do have NH4 plus floating around. Uh, you don't have any more of the acid floating in there. All of your H plus uh, is used up. So if you write out your reaction at the equivalence point, 
You have NH3 reacting with H plus to make NH4 plus. At equivalence, these two are equal, right? So there's no more of them, but you have lots of NH4 plus floating around in there. And then technically, uh, we also have the, I said sodium, but you're putting in hydrochloric acid into the system, right? So you also have Cl minus floating around. Not sodium, I apologize. Okay, and then the last part says, explain why the solution is acidic at the equivalence point of the titration using chemical equations to help with your answers. So go ahead and kind of evaluate, and I put it on your sheet of a weak acid titration with a weak base, with a strong, sorry, weak acid with a strong base. I explained that in that sheet for you, so you might want to take a look at that. Okay, so we're just going to show you the reactions over here. So this is the reaction of what's happening. NH3 is in your beaker, H plus goes in, but at equivalence point, these are equal, right? And they're all gone. They completely reacted to make NH4 plus. So NH4 plus at this point, right, completely is just sitting in water. We know that a weak acid or a weak base has an equilibrium to the left, but if you put ammonium in water, it's going to make a little bit of ammonia and H3O plus. So your H3O plus is what's going to be floating in there. So we're going to do this tomorrow where we're going to calculate the pH at all the different points of the titration curve for a weak acid with a weak base. But if I ask you to find the pH of this, recognize that at this point, you are going to do a Ka value to solve for this. Because Ka would be equal to x squared over this concentration. And you would know this concentration because all of the moles would be equal to the moles of this. Okay, it's going to get in depth tomorrow. But uh, tonight you're just going to finish your homework from this section just to kind of grasp the easy stuff. And then I'll give you the harder stuff tomorrow in class.